Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, grifters, drifters, and weightlifters, welcome along to the Joe Spivey YouTube channel, where we discuss books and little else. And welcome back to People in April, folks, a laudable booktube event where the uh, reading of biographies and life writing and memoirs and presumably letter and essay collections is actively encouraged. Um, one of the fine hosts was kind enough to comment on one of on, on my um, People in April TBR the other day, so I am I, I, I feel uh, coddled by the community, as it were. So um, yes, let us press on, and uh, we have our our first contribution to People in April today. Uh, I touted it and teased it and um, advertised some of its brilliance and some of its uh, sort of comedic twinges earlier on uh, last week. And this is Martin Amis, the biography by Richard Bradford, published in 2011. So this is uh, a time of recording about 13, 14 years old now. So this is, um, yeah, this is aging nicely, I think. I'm not going to use that detestable proverb like a fine wine, because if, if, any, if ever you are talking to an individual and they use that simile, um, you should dunk them in the nearest river because that is the most foul cliche possible. And this is a man who despised cliches um, in, a, in an even more visceral way, folks. Um, so Martin Amis, a, um, goodness me, what, what, what might, might we say? A, a, a scion and um, the, he was the apotheosis of, sort of late 20th century literature where writers were gods, where the codex and the novel and the written word was... Um, rather indulgently and rather um, rather spiritedly um, the centre of the culture. It was, you know, writers were paid as much as uh, movie directors on occasion. Um, it, it wasn't uncommon for scandals to be mediated through the novel. And Martin Amis was, was, was the, um, the, the best remunerated of that bunch. Ian McEwan, Salman Rushdie, uh, who else comes to mind? I can't quite think. But that's that, that crew, you know, you know, of whom I speak. Um, and yeah, I was a a sort of uh, an indolent, stupid, dim-witted, wrong-headed, uh, uh, sort of gleefully incurious seventeen and eighteen-year-old um, when one day I picked up this book uh, entitled Money by Martin Amis and um, transported me to a whole new world, folks. Um, a world which I have since. Um, renounced, or at least I have um, reneged on some of my uh, uh, on some of my promises to those works. But but nonetheless, he has to be credited with with being one of my um, original Twin Peaks, or at least yeah, somebody who introduced me to the world of uh, malevolent and um, rewardable and rewarding and enthralling literature. Um, the man himself, as portrayed here by Richard Bradford, again, goodness knows where do we start? He was um, sort of remarkably similar to, to, to Joe Spivey who picked up money when he was 17 and 18. He was a kind of slovenly, knuckle-dragging uh, idiot who would spend most of his time in the local uh, Greasy Spoons eating sausages and bacon and playing on the Space Invaders and reading nothing but comics and was with the, um, the, the assiduity of a pervert was acquainting himself with the uh, rudiments of um, magazine pornography in the uh, sort of the, the what will have been the, probably the early 70s um, until his father Kingsley Amis who was a uh, a brilliant writer uh, uh, in his own regard um, married or, or sorry remarried uh, Elizabeth Jane Howard who again was an author in her own right as well um, and she was the person who essentially pulled him up by his breeches uh, you know sort of brushed him down and because um, he was somebody who was to use his phrase averaging an O level every year uh, he all of a sudden became um, very very invested in uh, uh, his own discovery of literature and in um, his own um, what might we call an ed his own edification his own uh, uh, very slow um, ruminative process where he uh, you know acclimatized himself to the canon and to verbal vivacity and verbal agility and to yeah, the, the art of the written word. And without Elizabeth Jane Howard, and crucially probably without Kingsley Amis, Martin would never have been the individual that he, he became and was lauded for. Um, it is my strong contention, and it is unfortunately not really um, covered in this book, that had Martin not been the uh, 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 son of Kingsley Amis, had he not had a, a sort of uh, pre-brushed path through the maelstrom that is getting one's first uh, work published, had he not already had um, a, an agent at Cape that would, that would have printed his own shopping list, given that he was the son of a writer, had he not had that, I don't think a syllable of Martin Amis's uh, novels would ever have been published. Um, 
again, Bradford treads this line. If, if you're coming for the nuances of Martin Amos's life and you, and you want the bits and bobs of him, you know, whether he walked his dog before 8 a.m., um, whether he visited toy stores with his sons, uh, whether he enjoyed going to New York and his Brooklyn brownstone, whether he liked ice cream, whether he had pesto with his pasta, what um, his taste of sport and music was, you're not really going to get that here. You're going to get a, a forceful and um, a really rather committed devotee of his works. I've, I've never known anybody go into um, money and the information and time zero and experience with um, <clears throat> as much granular dedication as uh, Mr. Bradford. He is somebody who clearly takes, uh, who, who, for whom the books have brought great joy and indeed some kind of um, um, objective academic rigour as well. He, he clearly thinks there's something to them, whereas I just think they're a sort of um, I don't know, what are they? They're a kind of, just a sort of parcel of masturbatory, pre-apic self-indulgence, really. It's, it's, it's all, pretty much all I get from them nowadays. Um, but yeah, Bradford sort of trots that ground. Um, he trots the ground of um, uh, Amos being uh, a little bit of a, uh, you know, not a womanizer, not really a philanderer, but somebody um, who appealed to the fairer sex, I believe it might be phrased. Um, he, was, he was somebody who could go into a room and could um, completely illuminate all of uh, the females with his, his charming wit and his, again, his academic rigour and, um, yeah, just, just some of those kind of extemporaneous quips, um, uh, sort of, of uh, because of, due to which I am sometimes praised myself. Um, so, yeah, I, I mean, Bradford's got some, he's got excellent subject matter here. It, it would be, well, almost impossible to write a boring Martin Amis biography, but I've got some sections that I want to, to pick out here. Uh, and as I said, he's never had a more uh, devoted chronicler of his works. He's never had um, a, a better and more um, uh, munificent uh, uh, assessor of some of his writing. You, 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 if, you, if you had never read a Martin Amis novel um, and had just come to this uh, wanting to know about the uh, one of the key literary figures of a, of a particular period, you would think that Amos had won four Nobel Prizes, three Bookers, and, you know, the Whitbread Prize or whatever. You would think that he was a, an absolutely uh, sterling writer of, of all sorts of characterization and of um, um, plot device and of um, sort of uh, 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 rhetorical brilliance as well. You would think that there was everything in the novels when, in fact, I would contend that there really is not, and I think Bradford's working jolly hard to make sure that his literary hero is um, lionised when he should have done the mature thing long, long ago, which is what I've done, which is to um, just regard them as sort of guilty pleasures and thank them for, continually for welcoming, in, welcoming you into the world. Um, but nonetheless, we've got things that we need to pick out. Um, I've, I've put in the margin here that this bit is, so, and I quote, sodding marvellous. Um, so this is talking about uh, Martin and his brother, when um, uh, uh, Kingsley, Kingsley Amos is married to uh, Amos's mother, Martin's mother, Hilly, breaks down, and, and um, his stepmother, Elizabeth Jane Howard, who, as I said, is credited with his um, edification, comes into being, and you get that. Apparently, Amos was a, a great, he had a, a talent for mimicry and was just essentially great company, and um, yeah, Bradford tries to explore that here. So um, this is talking about, no one could blame them, but Kingsley managed to avoid most of their wrath. Uh, both had inherited from their father a talent for mimicry and, uh, and Jane's verbal mannerisms. Unselfconsciously, upper class, along with her postures and head movements, were gradually assimilated and malevolently reproduced, particularly when responding to her complaints about their behaviour and suggestions as to how they might improve themselves. All accounts of the period present Martin and Philip, that's his brother, as equally hostile to Jane and shrewd in their handling of Kingsley. So, yeah, you, you have... I mean, they had... Um, as Kingsley was becoming famous uh, for his, his writing, uh, most notably with Lucky Jim, uh, obviously the royalties were going up and they were bobbing about all over the place. Um, there, are there are sort of awful stories, or, or at least enticing stories, about um, the, the, the ribaldry and the debauchery and the, um, the, the, the complete seat of the pants hedonism that seemed to go on behind his door, at, behind the, the Amos door when... Um, himself and Philip were seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, and twelve, and he would wake up and you know the the the, uh, the editor of the the Guardian, no, not well, the Guardian, did the Guardian, did the Guardian exist in the seventies? I'm not sure, but uh, some you know some really important person from the Times would have their face in an ashtray, and then you know Marlena Dietrich would be in the corner having a cigarette of her own, and you know just some some other. Um, 
ridiculously laudable celebrity would be would have their face in spaghetti in the other corner as well. So, so <laughs> Bradford paints a picture of um, 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 you know carnal abandon and of um, alcoholism and of all of the other uh, acts of sensualism. Um, next up, we have the, um, the the endearing and the the, the uh, Martin Amos's wondrous jump from essentially, as I've said before, um, stupid knuckle dragging ignorant uh, yob to. Um, somebody who I regard as one of the finest literary critics, certainly of his day, um, in the space of two or three years. Um, there are obvious differences, of course. Principally, Martin is either too in awe of the cat. This is talking about um, their, his own and Kingsley's canonical considerations. There are obvious differences, of course. Principally, Martin is either too in awe of the canon or lacking in confidence to turn intuition into vilification. Either way, his inhibitions would soon be dispersed. It is astonishing that within four years of his having first properly encountered literature per se, Martin would be writing pieces for the TLS, the New Statesman and Observer that caused great trepidation among the most established writers with books out for review. Um, and yeah, you can read some of his earlier pieces. They are um, bratty. They are um, uh, ridiculously, they are effacing. They are, um, yeah, obviously critical, but, but, but they have a, a flair and a verve and an energy of their own. They are self-contained, entertaining works. Um, you don't have to have read the subject matter, you don't have to have read the books. Um, this is another aspect that Bradford doesn't go into, his excellent non-fiction work. He talks bits about the second plane and Terry Eagleton's demonisation of him um, when he was at the University of Manchester. Um, but he, he doesn't have the guts to say that the war against cliché and the second plane and um, the rub of time, which to his credit, or, 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 or to be fair to Bradford, may not have been released when, when this was published, but nonetheless, um, he doesn't have the, 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 the gumption and the gall to say that um, the non-fiction is much better than the fiction. But anyway, um, this is where uh, it quotes DJ Taylor, who I believe was he a literary critic of the time, I can't quite remember. Yeah, uh, there's DJ Taylor and his own ruminations about um, what Amos does in the early works and why it's so... Um, why it's so eye-catching and why it's so uh, very popular amongst, um, you know, sort of newly pubescent young men or whatever. Um, so this is DJ Taylor. With hindsight, we can find remarkable and original qualities in those early novels by Martin, um, but they were treated then as raffish sops to contemporary taste. Eccentric, faintly morbid, very funny of course, but still rather orthodox. In truth, they were the foundations for a remarkable achievement. Notably, this is not DJ Taylor now, this is Bradford. In truth, they were the foundations for a remarkable achievement, Notab notably a previously inconceivable hybrid involving the purest strain of modernism, the kind of writing that revels in its own elegant vividness, and a capacity to reduce the most sombre, mirthless readers to guilty laughter. A capacity to reduce the most sombre, mirthless readers to guilty laughter. And I'm not denying that. You, you, yep, the most mirthless readers will be uh, thrown into to, 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 uh, ridiculous laughter by money and by London Fields and by the Rachel Papers and by success and by bits of Einstein's monsters and all of that. It's, it's, it's funny, but Bradford go, makes a leap too far in saying that there is some kind of higher, hidden, um, intuitive, moral purpose behind any of Amos's writings. The fact that he is chin stroking and, and, and looking out upon the metropolis and that, you know, I'm not denying that there are some wonderful cityscapes and there's Dickensian caricature and there are great introductions and there are all sorts of, of gorgeous turns of phrase, but I don't think that it's anything other than, um, I don't think there are anything other than tidbits and trinkets. I don't know what the American v word for uh, busking is, but in this country we have um, mediocre individuals who think themselves talented, who, to be fair to them, stand on the street side and play the bassoon or, you know, try and imitate Chopin on the piano or seemingly nowadays just, just rap along with Eminem, um, who try and, you know, who, who try and induce passers-by to um, part with, you know, bits and bobs of their, their spare change. And that's all I think Martin's stuff is. It's, you know, oh, here comes the bloody writer with his similes and with his metaphors and with his, um, his, his, his quite sort of innocuous and, um, you know, just just uh, somewhat bestial turns of phrase. I don't think there's anything deep in there, um, and nor do I anything. Nor do I think is there anything deep to this biography either. Um, it's 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 great that we get the man in here, but but I I was looking for a kind of uh, rabble rousing summation at the end. Um, I was looking for. Obviously, he says that he's the writer of his generation, and he inspired many. Uh, he has he has. Um, you know, sort of uh, so much literary progeny after him, so many people have to thank Amos for their 
um, their own literary precepts or their own preeminence, um, which I would doubt again. But yeah, we, we don't get a, a kind of a, a final paragraph of him. We just get a kind of a, a, a sauntering recapitulation of, of much of the praise that was given out at the time. Um, one of the things that he does mention really nicely is um, Martin went for the jugular of Joseph Stalin, as all uh, public commentators should. Uh, much of the commentary should do so. And he highlighted the, 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 um, the relative difference in seemingly academic treatment of Hitler's Holocaust and of the, the Nazi scourge in continental Europe and um, uh, uh, Joseph Stalin's murdering of, similar murdering of many millions uh, just a little bit further north in Russia. Um, and yeah, point, he sort of Amy's pincered um, James Fenton and Christopher Hitchens at the time, and of course Hitchens just replied with the most rebarbative smugness possible, in that he, you know, uh, accused Martin of ignorance or of um, miscomprehension or of um, sort of he he he. Christopher Hitchens was always sort of really, really patronising uh, as regards Martin's political comments. Um, but yeah, so here we have uh, 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 Bradford very, very perspicaciously and um, very carefully taking apart the difference between Stalinist terror and, um, you know, Hitlerian uh, genocide. So we have, um, there was also, contends Martin, a long tradition of intellectual snobbishness, which, without exculpating Stalin, he had clearly presided over a disaster, at least set him apart from the uncouth ideology of Hitler. Marx, drawing upon Kant and a magnificent tradition of philosophic insurrection, going back to the Enlightenment, was undeniably a great thinker, while fascism was state-sanctioned mob rule, cultivating the base prejudices of the ill-educated with its programmes of racial purity through eugenics. Here, Martin again quotes Solzhenitsyn, who contended that both uh, communism and fascism were forms of ideological enforcement. The former might have appeared more just and righteous than the latter, but neither allowed for dissent. The individual was denied the opportunity to opt out of what others deemed an improvement upon his condition. So this is the uh, Martin's Cobra the Dread, which is not something I've read, actually. Um, I realised throughout the course of this that I've said in the past that I've read, I think, every single published word of Amos, but, but um, I, I'm, I'm at least two or three. I think I'm about three shy, actually. But anyway, that, uh, that matters not. So yes, um, again, he devotes the final sort of chapter to um, essentially... Obviously, Martin was still alive when 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 uh, this was written, so so you you can you can um, feel Martin's breath uh, breathing down his neck a little bit, or yeah, you, you can at least tell that that you know he's he's trying to uh, genuflect before his master, and um, there are there are allegations of misquoting and of um, uh, 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 sort of quite uh, what might we say. Um, uh, mischaracterising some of Amos's uh, life in, in, you know, in bad faith in this. So you can tell that Bradford's um, sort of trying to overcorrect and, and is, I think, uh, just far too kind to some of Amos's writing. And so, yeah, this is the final chapter and he gives us, um, he's, he's supposed to, he, he is supposedly, he's quoting London Fields here, um, which involves Keith Talent, who is most notable for his um, proficiency at the dartboard, throwing missiles at a board. Um, and he meets Nicholas Six, who is, as per usual, a kind of superficial uh, seductress with high heels and fine hips and a lovely hip to weight ratio and a penchant for lipstick and for, um, you know, slapping men across the face, essentially. So this is, um, so yeah, he's talking about how brilliant this is supposed to be. And you'll get bits and bobs of Amos here, the, um, you know, some of the, the kind of skullduggery and some of the, um, some of the humour, but, but you won't get the depth that Bradford thinks he's um, evidencing here. So this is from London Six. This is from, this from London Fields. Is Nicola welcoming Keith to her flat for the first time? Come up, she said. As Keith followed her heavily into the apartment, Nicola did something right out of character. She cursed her fate. Then she swivelled and inspected him from arid crown to Cuban heels as he cast his scavenging blue eyes around the room. Keith stripped of all charisma from pub and street. It wasn't the posture, the scrawniness of the shanks and backside, the unpleasant body scent, he smelled as if he had just eaten a mustard-coated camel, the drunken scoop of his gaze, unappealing though these features certainly were. Just that Nicola saw at once, with uh, a shock, I knew it all along, she said to herself, that the capacity for love was extinct in him. It was never there. Keith wouldn't kill for love. He wouldn't cross the road, he wouldn't swerve the car for love. Nicola raised her eyes to heaven at the thought of what this would involve it, her insexually, and in earnest, Truth, she had always felt that, that love in some form would be present at her death. The very best first third person narratives are those who keep us guessing about their partialities and affiliation, make us wonder who in the novel we know best, 
whether this impression is false, and most of all, make us question about uh, make us ask questions about why we are being made to jump through such hoops. This short passage is a superb example of third-person double bluffing. The mood seems droll, almost satirical, but this is a reflection of Nicholas' state of mind or a protective film, but perhaps lent uh, perhaps lent to the narrator by Young to smother something much darker and potentially macabre at the heart of the book. And unfortunately, I've never, I, I, I mean, I, I think most of the time I was just in complete amazement by Amos in my early days that somebody could write such, um, such flagrant humour and such, uh, yeah, such alarmic comedic verse. But um, I've, I've never since got anything from, from the works, unfortunately. But yes, that's, uh, that's, that's a very long video on, uh, yeah, Richard Bradford's biography of Martin Amos. And next up, folks, for people in April, we have another tome, another toe crusher. We have, uh, like the Roman, The Life of Enoch Powell by Simon Heffer, which I'll be getting into from today indeed. So yes, um, I hope I haven't mumbled too, not too much. I hope I haven't been, I hope I haven't been too incoate. Um, I struggle to organise my thoughts on this because um, it's just a pyrotechnical display with Martin Amos. There is so much that I could lecture you guys on, but I shall not. Um, so yes, I'm pretty much going to wrap this video up here. And um, thank you ever so much for watching BookTube and say goodbye.